Welcome back, everyone. And thank you for joining me again. This is a pretty exciting one for me. Uh, when I came across this research, I was, I was pretty thrilled because there are many uh, different uh, misunderstandings going out around out there in, uh, in the blogosphere and the, the internet universe and even in the scientific community um, that don't have updated information. And when I have the opportunity to bring updated information, even if it's preliminary, which this is, uh, it, it can allow us a glimpse of the inside, a better understanding how the human body works. And this one's pretty exciting because it tackles another one of those things that may turn out to be another big myth uh, and a concern of why not to do a plant-based diet uh, being, being uh, thrown out the window once again. All right, so uh, first things first, I am not a practitioner. Uh, nothing discussed is intended nor should be interpreted to prevent, treat, cure any health condition or disease. This video is for informational and educational purposes only. Now let's get started. Vitamin K. <clears throat> so I've noticed, um, you know, a lot of blogs and stuff, uh, a lot of the groups talking about how vegans and plant, those on a plant-based diet may need more vitamin K because uh, plants have vitamin K1 and animals have vitamin K2. And that's why they thought, oh, well then getting vitamin K2, which is found in animals, would be preferable since that's what our body actually uses. And that makes sense on the very top surface. <laughs> but when you look at it, where do the animals get their vitamin K2? Like K2 uh, in, in say cow. Where does the cow get his vitamin K2 or her, her bull cow, her female cow and a bull is a male. But anyway, how do they get their vitamin K2? Obviously, they're eating grass naturally in a natural environment. They'd be eating grass all day. So dark greens is where we get, most of us get uh, most of our vitamin K. <clears throat> now, the big question was, well, does it convert well enough to vitamin K2? When they did original studies on those consuming a standard American diet, they found very poor conversion rates of vitamin K to one from vitamin K1 to K2. So they thought, whoa, big red flag. If uh, vegans are and plant-based folks are eating only vitamin K1 and it's not and it's poorly converted, they're probably not getting enough of the vitamin K2 and then should probably supplement vitamin K2. Well, this study, even though it's a preliminary and it's an animal study, and no, I do not support animal testing whatsoever. I'm an ethical vegan. Uh, I don't think that's, but at the same time, if we can learn information from these poor animals that have died from this, I think that's the least we can do uh, to value their life and their contributions. Uh, I hope that we can get away from animal testing completely. It's not needed. This research and research like it can be done uh, inobtrusively by doing blood draws and things like this, looking at the microbiome through uh, lots of other different ways. Um, uh, so no need for animal testing, but this, this initial uh, research was done on mice. <clears throat> and yes, not everything converts in that fully aware. Um, but in this case, the microbiome is, is similar to the human microbiome. So it's a, it's a fairly decent uh, sample for a crossover. Now, what they did was something very interesting was they looked at vitamin K2 and bone health. Uh, so what is vitamin K? What does it do? So vitamin K is an enzymatic cofactor and it's required for uh, certain proteins to actually be produced and function correctly. One of the more important ones for bone health is called osteocalcin. Now, osteocalcin is uh, what actually makes up the strength of the bone. If you ever, if you ever taken a bone apart, uh, animal bone probably, and when I was a meat eater way back though, over 35 years ago, and you just break a bone, you can see those little fibers that go through the bone that look like little, little fingers or, or splinters uh, that go out that. Those are actually um, uh, predominantly um, non-collagen type proteins called osteocalcin, and they actually make up the fiber. Think of it like, uh, have you ever seen a bridge that has the whole network, the, the matrix underneath it? Well, it's that matrix, that cross connections that keeps it strong. And that's what helps keeps our bones strong. Because when that osteocalcin breaks down, then you just got a outer, 
uh, hard outer shell and it can break uh, much easier. And that's why we get the bone fractures and stuff. So vitamin K is very important for bone health. Now vitamin K also plays a role in lots of other different forms of health um, coming uh, like homeostasis in and blood clotting factor, factors and things like this. So there's lots of good reasons to uh, make sure you're getting sufficient vitamin K, but bone health is, is one of the, the most important. So they, they did something very interesting. They gave the mice a dose of antibiotics. Now, humans are consuming antibiotics. I mean, the amount of antibiotics humans are taking is ridiculous. And then you add into the effect the antibiotics that are feeding to the animals that are still present in their tissues, and we're getting that when we eat animal products, you've got a lot of exposure to antibiotics. Well, antibiotics kill bad bacteria, but they also kill good bacteria. And what they did in this study is they looked at what was the impact. And they found that when they did a dose of, of, of antibiotics to the bacteria and, and knocked out a lot of their good probiotic bacteria, their bone uh, fractures went up significantly. Just this, this dosage of oral antibiotics decreased their vitamin K production by 32 to 66 percent, two thirds of their vitamin K got wiped out because the disruption in their microbiome. Now this is really interesting because remember the original studies were saying, "Hey, wait, you know, on the standard American diet, we don't convert vitamin K1 to vitamin K2 very efficiently or very effectively." But now we're seeing a totally different picture. So if you take a plant-based diet, remember most of the vitamin K is coming from dark greens, right? So dark greens really high in vitamin K. And what are they also high in? Fiber. What does fiber do? Prebiotic fiber feeds the gut bacteria. It increases that gut bacteria. And now with more of that gut bacteria, they can take the K1 and dissolve it and eat it and kick out K2. So now our K2 production goes way up. So if they actually looked at the gut microbiome and then found a healthy plant-based fed microbiome, someone eating a lot of green vegetables, <coughs> excuse me, then you'd see it increases the microbiome, the bacteria that actually do the conversion of K1 to K2. So I am, I am guessing right now that if you actually took side by side with animal-based diet and then a plant-based diet, you'd see the microbiome producing a lot more of the of feeding basically through the fiber and through nutrients. There are three key things that feed the microbiome. Uh, exercise has been shown to improve the microbiome. Obviously fiber, prebiotic fibers, oligosaccharides especially, but also polyphenols. There's new research that shows plant polyphenols. Remember polyphenols are only found in plants, fiber only found in plants. So you've got to eat these to increase your microbiome. And obviously exercise also helps improve microbiome, both in density and in variety. But by feeding it with these polyphenols, high polyphenol content, high fiber content, you're increasing the microorganisms, the good friendly bacteria, the probiotics that actually do the conversion of K1 to K2. So in those who are exclusively plant-based and eating mostly a whole food plant-based diet or really high in polyphenols and fiber, you're going to increase the amount of bacteria that are producing the vitamin K2. Now, what's interesting is this. So the old research to recap, vitamin K1 poorly converts to vitamin K2. And now we understand why this new research on the animals showed a, the, the antibiotics reduced their K2 production by up to 66%. So if you're using antibiotics, you're, you're really reducing your body's ability to produce K2, your body through its microbiome. And remember, this original research was done on omnivores who may have had compromised, most likely had a compromised microbiome by not eating enough plant-based materials, especially polyphenols and fiber. When you change that, that increases dramatically. So the plant prebiotic fiber improves the microbiome, which results in increased vitamin K conversion. 
So dark greens are both high in fiber and in vitamin K, and that's exactly what nature has done. They put this vitamin K in high amounts in foods that are already high in fiber that feed your gut bacteria that in turn can convert that vitamin K1 into K2. Now, I wanna show you one of my favorite sources of it, and it's really exciting because we actually didn't know clean green protein had vitamin K into it until we re recently tested for it. And when we find out if it had any vitamin K at all, we were stunned by what we found. Just one scoop of clean green protein with lentine contains 1174% of the DV of vitamin K. Now that is huge. Now remember, it also contains about one third of your total daily requirement for fiber. And it's really rich in polyphenols too. So you got the fiber, you got the vitamin K, and you got the polyphenols. The polyphenols and fiber upregulating the amount of uh, microbiome that do the conversion, and then a super high amount of vitamin K. So this lentine is in its whole food state. So you're getting a whole food, plant based, nutrient dense source of protein, also rich in. Uh, and vitamin K, and of course, the very first plant protein powder with naturally occurring vitamin B12 in it. So this is amazing. And once again, we're finding, you know, the old adage because of the research was done um, uh, just on uh, the standard American diet, mostly omnivore meat eating based diet. And then when we look at uh, plants or we look at what happens when you actually remove the, the microbiome, which is fed and supported by plants and polyphenols, that it nearly wipes out our, our vitamin K conversion rate at all. So once again, we're showing that a plant-based diet is not only sufficient, but may be superior and optimal to an animal-based diet, getting your versions, getting your amounts of quality vitamin K1, and then converting to K2 through a healthy gut microbiome. This is such great information. I love when this information comes out. I love sharing it with you guys because, not only because it's in the products that we do, I, I, I create these products because I want to provide the best products for you, the healthiest products out there. Um, you know, if I wanted to sell something, I would sell something else that was more popular. Not everybody's going to want uh, their protein with all their greens in it, with all the nutrient value in it. So uh, all the fiber. I even had someone complain that it was too much fiber. And I'm like, okay, but that's what whole food is. That's what whole food does. Whole food has lots of natural, whole plant foods have natural fiber, natural polyphenols and stuff like this. So not for everyone. I'm not out there just to sell products. I'm out there to provide some of these amazing plants that other companies won't provide because they can make more money selling you garbage. And, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that, look, I've been in the industry for over 30 years and I've seen a lot of bad players out there. So I understand why there's a lot of pessimism towards supplements. I get it. I, I have the same thing. But there's so many amazing plants out there that have such great value to them that they need to be uh, available to more people. I want to make these plants more available. Most people, when I tell them about ahi flower or lentine, they, they've never even heard of it. That's because none of the other companies out there will bring these plants to market. Why? Because they cost a lot more, four to five, 10 times more than, than some of the other products that are selling out there. But I don't care. I don't need to make a whole lot of money. I just want to make sure I get the best you know, plants available in their nutrient. And, and ahi flower is the highest and omega-3-6 of any plant known. Uh, the richest source of SDA on the planet that we know of in a non-GMO source. You know, lentine, highest in protein, highest in nutrient density of any plant. And then now one of the highest in vitamin K, even, even better than kale, believe it or not. I mean, this is amazing. And the only one with B12 in it, we finally solved the B12 riddle of how can a, you get B12. And now I'm gonna be coming out with a vitamin D3, yes, that is actually from a real plant. Not, there are other vegan D3s out there, but the other D3s that are on the market are from mushrooms or from lichen, and those are not plants. Those are actually fungi, they're in the fungi class, so they're not a true plant. 
this is going to be from a, a true plant. Once again, like I was the first to bring a B12 in a true plant, inside of a true plant, living inside of a B12, these bacteria living inside of this plant, providing you with really true natural plant source B12 and vitamin K. This is amazing. These plants are incredible. They're the real heroes. I just want to be the person that tries to get these the information about these hero plants to you so you know about them, so you know the health benefits of them, and that, so that you can enjoy them and get the most out of your life, higher quality of life through higher nutrition. That's what I'm here for. I hope you enjoy this information. I know I get all geeked out and excited when I read these studies. But I, I feel like I can, since I, you know, my college days of learning to read studies and understanding them, that uh, I said, you know, there's a lot of studies out there that go totally unnoticed. This one just flew by and most people never even noticed it. It's been out for over a month. And then who knows, you know, nobody else talks about it besides maybe a, pe a few people in the scientific community. I want to bring this information to the every person, to all the rest of the people who may not be scientifically inclined but want to know what are the best things to put in my body? How do I keep this body healthy? You know, it, am I not getting, should I be supplementing with vitamin K2? And, and right now, you know, I am, I am in the position now to say, based on this information, I don't feel that there's any need for me to ever take vitamin K2, period. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to take it as a supplement. And, and you know, you're saying, Jeff, but you, you sell supplements. And you're saying, there's lots of supplements I would never take. I don't take probiotics. I don't believe that that's the best approach to increasing your microbiome. You know, you have a microbiome with over 40 trillion cells in it. Why take a couple of billion in a, uh, in a supplement? That, that doesn't make sense. It's not going to be a major impact. When you can consume the fiber and the polyphenols that feed all 40 trillion of them, why not raise your whole 40 trillion in diversity and complexity and activity so that you have a true whole healthy microbiome, not just a tiny little segment of it. There are over 400 different species of bacteria and, and yeast and, and, and different microbes that live in our body for a, a positively functional basis. And you know most that you see in supplements are a few strains. Now, there's a place for probiotics if you're really in a bad health state and you need to improve it. Yes, that, that could be uh, important. As a is a uh, the best approach? No, I think prebiotic in, in focusing on whole foods and fiber and things rich in polyphenols, this is a much better approach to hitting all of your micro community, your whole microbiome, instead of just a small fraction of it through taking it. So there's several supplements out there that I would never even take or never even bother with. And because um, there's there's different ways of approaching it that actually are better. I'm looking for the best ways. Supplementation can be a good thing for those who are traveling, for those who are not getting the right foods in on a consistent basis to make sure just because you're traveling or doing something or too busy or eating out or whatever, that you're not getting that nutrition you need, at least get those nutritional bases covered because that's all your body cares about. It doesn't, you know, it says, am I deficient or do I have what I need to, to function properly? So be good to your body, take care, enjoy the information, spread the information, give us a like um, and uh, let me know if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. Uh, so we've got one little comment. Hey, Richard Howard, good to see you. Um, nice to see you. I hope to see you again once we get back out there to the shows. I know I see you at the Plant Based Expo. I know that's been postponed lately, but uh, yeah, we've got a couple new uh, a new Plant Based Expo coming out in Los Angeles too. Hope to get out to that one. Um, it's nice to see exclusively plant based companies forming expos and doing it just for the plant-based movement. I love that, supportive, giving back to our community. And uh, watch out for next month, we're gonna do a nice give back to a great uh, company. I'll be doing a Facebook Live and interviewing that nonprofit organization. We donate 10% of our uh, revenues from clean machine sales to a nonprofit that is doing good in our community um, every quarter. So stay tuned for that. We'll have an interview with Yvonne on the next one, and I'll see you on the next Facebook Live. Thanks for joining me.